everyone, and welcome to Mischief Manage, throwing a Hotsy Totsy Halloween bash. I'm Nicole Rogers, I'm a historic interpreter here at the Johnson Victrola Museum. Uh, today we're going to be showing you how to throw a 1927 themed Halloween party. Uh, so back in the 1920s, Halloween was kind of a new thing, uh, and it was actually a way to prevent what was called Mischief Night, where a bunch of kids would go out and cause a bunch of havoc across the states. So this was a way for uh, parents to make sure that their kids were being safe on Halloween. Uh, and we want to do that for everyone here now too. So this is a very safe version of a 1927 Halloween party. So we're going to be showing you a bunch of paper crafts. We're going to be showing you how to make a costume out of prey paper. Uh, we'll also be showing you how to make a paper mask, some paper pumpkin crafts, and we'll also be sharing some music with you that they would have played back in 1927. So let's have some fun and I hope you all enjoy. You're going to need several rolls of crepe paper. The best colors to wow your guests will be dark yellow and black, which are best for Halloween. You can also add in some lovely oranges and browns to create a larger range of colors. You'll want some glue. We're using an Elmer's brand glue here, but almost any mild adhesive will work. Make sure you have a pair of sharp scissors that can cut through your paper, as well as a tape measure. Measuring will be extremely important for the costume. And most importantly, we're going to need our sewing machine. Now, if you don't have a sewing machine, you can always use needle and thread. You'll also want some thick card-like paper. You'll want these in the same colors as the crepe paper. They'll help us make our mask for our costume. You're also going to want Victor Records. Be sure to have these on hand. These will make the atmosphere so perfect for Halloween. We recommend looking through Victor's catalogs and choosing the best spooky music you can find. One of the most important parts of your party is going to be the music that you choose to play. Now, Victor puts out some of the best spooky music on their Shellac 78 records. Now, the one we're going to be featuring here right now is Spooky Spooks. To make your mask, you're going to want to grab two sheets of the Halloween colored paper that we told you about in the beginning. Now we're using orange for this because this is going to be a jack-o'-lantern face later on. Begin by folding your paper one inch downward. And then once you've done that, you're going to want to repeat that alternating the folds. This is what we call an accordion fold, and this will make up one half of our mask. Once you've completed your accordion fold, you're going to want to take that sheet of paper all scrunched up and fold it in half. Once you fold it in half, you're going to want to grab that glue from the supply list and you're going to want to glue each of the inside edges together so that the accordion fold will not come apart when it's folded in half. Once you've got the glue on there, make sure to make the glue stick completely to the paper that you put something heavy on top of it. Here we're just using our needle and thread basket, but you can use almost anything that will sit on top of the paper. And while you're waiting for that glue to dry, then do the exact same steps to the other piece. While the glue is drying on the base of our mask, we're going to bring out another color of paper. This time we're using black to make the face. 
Now this will be your eyes and your mouth, but you're going to want this to be a little thicker than a thinner sheet. If you have a thick piece of cardstock, that's perfect, you don't have to do anything here. But since this is a thinner sheet, I am going to take it, fold it in half, and glue it down and wait for it to dry. Food was also incredibly important for Halloween parties in the 1920s. As they were in season, pumpkins and other squashes were often on the menu. Pumpkin pie was definitely one of the more popular dishes, but so were the roasted seeds of various squashes. Sometimes the seeds could be seasoned, but usually they were just salted. Apples were also a common food due to their being in season as well. They could either be baked or raw. Sometimes the apples would even be made into a sweetened cider as a beverage option. On the more savory side of the party, tons of finger foods would be available for the guests. Dill pickles were a huge hit at the time, as were deli meat sandwiches. The savory foods would be the main course, and they would almost always be some type of finger food. For dessert, a host could have any type of doughy sweet. Occasionally, donuts would be served, usually sprinkled in sugar, and sometimes in cinnamon. But the most common dessert would be the Halloween cake. These cakes were usually used as centerpieces for the table, as they were decorated in bright oranges, yellows, and reds. You know, all the Halloween colors. And they always featured images of things like witches and jack-o'-lanterns on them. The reason for the cake's popularity on Halloween at the time was due to a long-standing tradition for anyone of Celtic origins. Cakes in the 18th and 19th centuries were offerings to the long-deceased. It was believed that a cake offering to the dead would set their spirit free. This tradition was brought to America by Irish immigrants and remained popular well into the 1930s. Once that's dry, you're going to want to draw out the face shapes that you want for your jack-o'-lantern face for your mask. Here I'm using a lead pencil. You can also use white chalk or anything that will show up on the page. Once you have the desired shape for the eyes and the mouth drawn out on your paper, take your pair of scissors and cut out those shapes. Make sure that your glue is dry from those two orange pieces that we worked on before, and then you're going to want to assemble them. Take each one, put glue on the outermost edge, and then hold them together. Now, this is a little tricky, and you're going to want to hold it for a little while to make sure the glue sets. You can't really put anything heavy on top of it, or you'll mess up the beautiful folds that you've already done. And while we're on the topic of food, you can't forget candy for your trick-or-treaters. You're going to want a big supply of gumdrops, buttercups, hard candies, and licorice. But make sure they're the perfect Halloween colors. Orange and black. Now you'll need a strip of orange crepe paper for the headband. Make sure you glue each end of the crepe paper together so that it sits on your head nicely. Now it's time to assemble the face. Grab those face pieces that you cut out before and gently place them where you would like them on the mask. That way you know where to put the glue. Once you've done so, you can add the glue on each of the pieces that you would like to glue down. And then, once that is dried, you have the faces of your mask. To attach the mask to your headband, put down a dollop of glue and place your headband on top. Now you're going to want something heavy to press down on it so that when the glue dries, it completely adheres the mask to the headband. And then, your mask is complete! Try it on!
The first step to our costume is making a waistband. The way you get the waistband is measure around your waist. Take that measurement and add one inch, and then cut out a long rectangle that's about a few inches wide. Then, just fold it in half and you have the base of your waistband ready to go. Now we get started on the ruffles. You're going to want the first tier of your ruffles to be the same color as your waistband. Cut out a long strip of your crepe paper, about double the length of your waistband. We cut ours out about 6 inches in width, since we want it to be around 5 inches long on the skirt. Do this step twice, so you have two long strips of your first layer that are around 5 to 6 inches wide. Now be prepared to be patient, this does take a little while. Once you've finished your cutting for your first layer, you can get started on the next layer. Our next layer is going to be orange, and we do the exact same steps that we did on the other layer. Now here are all of our layers laid out on the table. Keep in mind we did get rid of the darker orange color later on, uh, but you don't have to. You can have as many layers or as little layers in your skirt as you would like. So you're going to want to grab one of the two longer pieces that you cut out. Uh, I'm using the white here since this is our top color. Uh, you want these to be about six inches wide. And you're going to also want to grab that waistband. Now these need to be the same color uh, so that you can't, in case you see anything underneath, you don't want it to be a drastically different color. And what we're going to do is we're just going to use these safety pins. Now we're going to attach one of our white strips to the waistband. Take both pieces and lay one over the other. Be sure to pin them together so they don't move around. And then place your pinned pieces under your needle on your machine. If you're hand sewing, you won't need to remove the pins as you sew. But with a machine, it is incredibly important that you remove the pins so as to not damage your machine. Remove each pin as you sew if you're doing it with a machine. To sew, using a straight stitch will be fine. Once you've finished the last step, grab your other long strip of crepe paper from the same color you attach to your waistband. This will become our ruffle. To make this piece a ruffle, you're going to want to pleat the entire strip. Do this by folding your fabric repeatedly and pinning the folds down so they don't shift. So here is our final pleated piece here. This is going to be our first tier ruffle. Now, from here on out, you're gonna wanna space out your pleats a little more because this took up a lot of the fabric, which is why you cut double the length of your waistband. So this next one, we're going to do bigger pleats. Halloween was still a fairly new holiday in the 1920s, so we wanted to talk a little bit about how it all started. Halloween originated from an ancient Celtic festival called Samhain. The festival was similar to what we would now call New Year's Eve, and it signaled the end of fall and the start of winter. Since winter was so often associated with the afterlife at the time, the festival of Samhain commemorated the memories of those who had passed on, and many believed their souls revisited the living once more on October 31st. As time passed, and the holiday evolved to include Roman traditions, the holiday became known as All Hallows' Eve. The holiday was initially reserved for honoring the dead, causing mischief, and predicting the future. When Halloween came to America in the 1700s, however, the celebrations were very limited, mostly taking place in the southern colonies. Eventually, the holiday would serve as a celebration of the harvest, while also telling stories of ancestors past. These celebrations became known as a form of party, as ghost stories began to emerge during this time to celebrate. Unfortunately, these parties also encouraged forms of mischief amongst children. By the early 20th century, local families were complaining constantly about the mischief that was being caused in American neighborhoods the night before Halloween. It was so prevalent that the night was deemed mischief night across the country for quite some time. 
and with each passing year the vandalism was becoming worse and worse. Communities sought ways to fight the mischief, and thus began hosting parades, community parties, and trick-or-treating events. These celebrations consisted of games, dancing, food, and fun festive costumes of all kinds. Hosts were encouraged to remove all essence of mischief, magic, and witchcraft from their celebrations, so as to discourage the mischief and vandalism from returning. By 1930, Halloween had truly transformed into the familiar holiday we know and love today. With your pleat completely finished, you can now sew the pleat to the top of the white strip you sewed to your waistband. We recommend that you pin this as well before you sew it, but remember to remove those pins as you're sewing. Now you're going to want to attach your orange strip to the white strip that is not pleated. These serve as the underlay to your ruffles. A straight stitch will be fine for this as well. After you've sewn the orange underlay, you'll want to take one of each of the colorful strips that you have and pleat them as well. Repeat the same process of underlay, pleat, and sewing the pleat to the underlay until you've completed your skirt. To close your skirt, be sure to turn it inside out, sew halfway up the back, and leave the top completely open. To close the top, you'll use a set of snaps or a hook and eye to close it. For authenticity, you're going to want to use either one of those, but if you have neither, Velcro will work as well. Hand sew the snaps two times on each side for stability. The more stable they are, the better it they will hold. Also, keep in mind this was around the time we decided to take that middle dark orange layer out. We felt like there were too many layers, the costume was too long, and really the color didn't work as well as we had hoped. This is so common when making a costume, so if you need to make changes along the way as you're making it, feel free. This is your costume, it can look like anything you would like. And here we have our finished tiered skirt. The crepe paper shirt requires a little more math than the skirt, so you're gonna want to get out your measuring tape. You'll want to measure from your shoulder down to a few inches past your skirt. And I'm talking about the waistband, not the bottom of the skirt. Also, measure your bust to see how wide the shirt needs to be. With those two measurements, use your bust measurement as your width and your shoulder to below the skirt measurement as your height, and cut out two identical rectangular shapes. For the head hole, you'll need to do a bit of math. Measure your head all the way around. This will be the circumference of the circle you will cut. Take that measurement and divide by pi, or 3.14. This measurement will be the diameter of your circle, which you will want to add half an inch to. Ours came out to be about 7.5 inches. Find the very middle of the top of your rectangle and make a mark. Then divide your diameter in half to get the radius. Ours came out to be about 3.75. Measure out your radius in each direction from the center that you marked and mark each end. From these ends, cut a half circle on both rectangles. This will be your head hole. If the shoulders are too wide, feel free to trim a few inches off and curve as needed. However, Boxy was in in the 20s, so our top is not going to have as much curve as you might prefer. The style in the 20s was definitely a box shape. Once you've cut your shirt pieces out, sew the tops of the shoulders, right sides facing each other, together with a straight stitch. When your shoulder seam is complete, flip the shirt inside out, but don't sew the sides. They should remain open. Now for a few embellishments. 
we'll be adding a decorative bow to this costume, and making one is a lot easier than you would think. Cut out a rectangle of the color you desire, making sure one side is longer than the other, then cut out a smaller strip of the same color. To make the bow, pinch the paper together like an accordion, and then wrap the smaller strip around the center. Also, cut out a long strip of paper for the waistband to attach the bow in the same color. To make sure the bow stays in place, glue the strip down in the back. Hold the piece together until the glue is completely dry. Once the glue is dry, you should have a gorgeous bow for your costume. And what would a costume be without some iconic Halloween imagery? Today, we're making bats. Grab your thick paper, draw out your shapes with pencil or white chalk, and then cut away. And here are the finished bats that we cut out for our costume. And finally, to complete our costume, we will glue the bat cutouts to the front of our shirt. And voila, the costume is complete. This costume took us about 11 hours to complete, but you can always simplify some steps or add other clothing to expedite the process. Remember, the costume is your own, so just have fun with it. Okay, now we're going to make ourselves some pretty paper pumpkins to use as decorations for our party. So you're going to want your orange paper back out again. Then you're going to want to cut that orange paper into strips. I'm doing them about an inch wide here, but you can do them as thin or as thick as you like. It can actually make a pretty unique pumpkin depending on which way you go, whether it's thick or thin with the strips. Make sure you keep it as straight as possible when you're cutting. Uh, if it's a little off, it's not going to be the end of the world. Just makes for a more unique pumpkin. And as we all know, all pumpkins are unique. Once you have all of your strips cut out, you're going to want to lay them flat. And you're going to want to put them into a star shape, almost like an asterisk on a keyboard. Once the glue from the last step is dry, you're going to want to take each end of each corresponding strip and pull them up to the top, and then you're going to want to glue those as well. Continue doing this until you've made a ball shape out of your strips here. And then you've pretty much got the base of your pumpkin done. Games were a big deal during parties in the 1920s. Popular games of the 20s included apple bobbing, ring tossing, and scavenger hunts. Many of these games would be a form of fortune telling, often for young women and men to predict their future spouses. One interesting party game we have to share though is called The Shadow Buff. This is a game found in Games for Halloween by Mary E. Blaine. She describes it as follows. A splendid game, and one specially suitable for a large party. A sheet or white tablecloth is first of all stretched right across the room, and on a table behind it is placed a bright lamp. All the other lights in the room are then extinguished, and one of the players takes a seat upon a low stool midway between the lamp and the sheet. The other players endeavor to disguise themselves as much as possible by distorting their features, rumpling their hair, wearing wigs, false noses, etc. And pass one by one behind the players seated on the stool. Their shadows are thus thrown upon the sheet. The aim of the seated player is to guess the identity of the shadows as they pass before him. And the aim of the others is to endeavor by every means in their power to keep him from recognizing them. As may be imagined, the task of the single player is not an easy one. 
the distorted shadows being vastly different from the originals as seen before the lights were extinguished. Now, what is a pumpkin without its leaves and vines? So now we're going to be cutting out a leaf shape from our green paper to add onto our pumpkin. I decided to do two leaves here. I think it adds more layers and depth to it, but you can add as many or as little as you would like. To make the vine, cut a very thin strip of the green paper and then wrap it around a pencil or a pen. It should curl. Once you have your leaves and your vine cut out and your vine curled, of course, you're going to want to glue those onto the finished pumpkin. And here are the pumpkins we made. So one of our pumpkins had thinner strips of orange paper and the other had thicker strips of orange paper. It all depends on your personal preference but I think both of them look absolutely beautiful and I'm sure yours will as well. Thank you all for tuning into the program. I hope you had some fun and maybe uh, learned a few things about Halloween during the 1920s. Uh, or maybe you made some pretty fun paper crafts uh, and maybe you're gonna take a chance on making a crepe paper costume. Either way, hope it was a great time for all. Oh, is that trick-or-treaters? Oh. Gotta run. Thanks for tuning in.